Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. We are glad you're here in the sanctuary. We are glad that you're here joining us virtually. We are going to continue um, the lighting of our Advent candle this season with Dennis and Juanita White. So welcome them as they light our third Advent candle this morning. As we light each candle this month, this is the, the third week, as Laura said, as we light each candle this month, we take a moment to speak into the dark, the darkness of our present world and the shadow of a promise yet to be fulfilled. We declare there is hope in a God who is present with us, peace to be found in the trials of each day, and joy in the ultimate remedy to our despair. The baby in the manger has brought to us salvation. 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9 reads, Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let us pray together. Lord, remind us of the good gifts that get lost when we turn away from your light. Teach us like the Magi to have the faith to trace the story of redemption from your word to your nativity, to your coming again. Thank you for the joy found in salvation. Amen. Those of you who are watching online, if you're looking for me, you're not going to see me. I'm off camera leading for Dave this morning. We're missing him. I encourage you to join us as we sing together. Let God touch your hearts. This is the Sunday of joy, so let's sing together. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like clouds before the opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness.
in thee. Arise and sing, ye children of Zion, for the Lord has delivered thee. Arise and sing, ye children of Zion, for the Lord has delivered thee. Open up your heart and rejoice before him. Open up your heart and rejoice before him. Open up your heart and rejoice before him, for the King is your God. Arise and sing, ye children of Zion, for the Lord has delivered thee. Arise and sing. Brother, loved ones, man. 
Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Jesus. Well, good morning. Glad you are here. It's glad to see you here. I wish I could see everybody. Well, no, we'll go back there. I can't. Don't do that. I am glad you're visiting us, though, online. I'm glad you're there. Uh, it is prayer time. I miss anointing. I got to tell you, I do miss anointing the old way. It seems forever ago since we used to have you file down, and we just get, we got to pray with you there. But uh, the great thing is, even though we're not doing it that way, the changes come, and uh, we roll with it. And God still hears our prayers, still knows our prayers. Change is difficult. We have been forced into many changes this year, um, but. As I said, God walks with us through each and every one of these changes. I do want to lift some people up to you specifically. Uh, I, the Walsh family, I don't know if you've got the notice, the email Jerry sent out. I want to thank those who donated and have given. Uh, great appreciation for that, to that family that lost their house in a fire. Um, you can still do that, by the way? Uh, yes. Phil Marcello, please lift him up. He is still going through some health issues, still trying to figure out what's going on in his body. Um, pray for him. Bob Backley had a knee operation this week. Um, I don't know if you know Bob. He sits back over here on a regular basis, but he's going through rehab. Pray for him as he goes through that. Uh, Gail, David, prays for answered prayers for employment. So yay, yay, great. It is good and to get those praise Jesus. things. Please always remember you can send them to we love to praise the Lord for what he's doing. And Chris, Chris Hay, Hayes is that? I'm sorry, I'm trying to read. Yes, okay. Alan's biopsy results on Wednesday and son moving off to campus and seeing a new doctor Friday. So all of those are her prayers. So lift them up if you could, please. I am going to go now and just we're going to lift them up together. Father God, we do thank you, Lord God, that you know each one of our prayers. Everyone sitting at home, those sitting in the pews here, Lord God, they've all lifted their hearts up to you and for many different things in their lives, Lord. And we know, Lord, we know with all confidence that you've heard each prayer, that you are moving in only the way you can, the way you do. I do lift up the Walsh family to you, Lord God, who have lost their house in this fire, Lord God, that you would be their Lord provider, Jesus. that you would be their comforter, Lord God, that they would, they would feel your presence, Lord God, that they would know your love, know your care and concern for them. For Phil, Lord, give the doctor's wisdom and skill, give his body the ability to, to heal itself, Father God. Be his healer, be his strength, Lord God, through all of this, through Bob Backley, Backley be with him as he goes through the therapy to, to regenerate his knee, to get his knee working again after this operation, Lord, give him strength in his body, Lord, too. We do thank you, Lord God, for the praise from Gail, for her employment, for, for moving in her life, Lord God. We, we thank you for all the things that you do in each of our lives, each and every day, seen and unseen. And for Chris Hayes, all the different things she put down here for the biopsy results and all those things some, for his son moving, Father God, you hear each prayer, you know each prayer, and you love each one of us. And you are our healer, our provider, our shield, and our comforter. Bless the rest of this service, Father God. Bless Jerry as he brings forth the word. May each one of us open our hearts to hear what you would have, have each one of us to hear. We thank you for your goodness to us here in this church and going forward throughout this land. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And thank you, Brother Gary. I invite you to stand as we make our declaration of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and our ancient creed. For I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead, the third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, in Christ's universal church, the communion of all believers, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. I am a 
Hallelujah. Sing with me. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and somebody this morning, give them a, a high five, a holy wave, an el elbow bump, whatever it might be, and then you may be seated. Laura's coming to lead us in our announcements. Well, good morning again. It is good to see you all. We do have a few announcements. Awana is meeting this afternoon at 4 o'clock. Our normal time and youth as well it is their Christmas party this evening so um, anyone is invited to come if you are supposed to be bringing something as a normal part of youth group uh, make sure you bring that along with you for the party but anyone in, in um, uh, not 11th grade 9th grade through 12th grade is welcome at 4 o'clock up in the Family Fellowship Center today um, Wednesday evening is still continuing um, for a few weeks. We will break for Christmas, I'm sure, but Wednesday night up in the Fellowship Hall. Yeah, I think it's supposed to snow on Wednesday, so check back. Um, check check um, Facebook, call the office. Pastor Jay will be letting you know if that's happening or not, but at the moment it is planned to happen on Wednesday evening. Um, Sister Strong is meeting this Friday as well. This will be our meeting for the month of December. Um, so we are continuing our study from Laura's story. And always, if you, if you haven't come before, you are always welcome, seven o'clock um, this Friday in the cafe. And um, today, Fran Pash will be signing copies of her book out in the cafe, so you can purchase that. She'll sign it for you. Um, she is a poet, um, so I'm sure the verses she has written would bless you. You can go talk with her and check that out after church. Um, and she'll be here this week, but you can buy it at any time. I think it's even on Amazon, mm -hmm. right? It's all fancy, like on the internet. Mm -hmm. So um, talk to Fran and you can bless her that way. Thank you again for your giving as always. Thank you for supporting the ministries that happen inside these walls and out from these walls. Um, we could not do that without your support, your prayer support, your monetary support. Thank you for being this community of faith that we can be. Um, let's continue to worship together. It's a joyful song, sing it with. Go tell it on the mind.
Amen? Are you telling the story? You know this one. Lift up your voices or your hearts or whether you're singing, I don't know, but join us. Joy to the world. Thank you, musicians. Appreciate it. Glad when Dave is back next week. Ah, joy. How you doing with that? You doing okay with joy? Good. I'm glad for each of you who are in the house. Uh, I'm going to take. I'm going to take a second here. Let this video play and catch my breath. When you sing, wave your hands around and stomp your feet all at the same time. It gets you out of breath when you're 65. That's what we've been doing. We've been rediscovering Christmas. This morning we talk about joy. I remember February 10th, 1977, like it was yesterday. Any, any of you know why February 10th, 1977 is significant in my life? What? No, I was ordained in 1980. My first son was born. <laughs> Bev woke me up about 2 o'clock that morning and said, Honey, it's time to go and have the baby and I said now nah, just stay in bed because we'll go later when we're not sleeping yeah, I did honest to the Lord that's what I told her she did not she woke me up she said we must go 
And so we drove through the dark to Hackestown Hospital. We were shaking with excitement, a little bit with fear. What was ahead of us? Would our baby be healthy? This was ancient times, so would it be a boy or a girl? We didn't know back then. And when the doctor examined Bev, when we got there, he said, your baby is in the breech position. If you don't know what that is, he was upside down. Instead of presenting with his head, he was presenting. Uh, we've teased Jay ever since that he backed into the world and has been backing into the world ever since. <laughs> but he, uh, he was in the breech position. The doctor said that's a very risky delivery, and she, her labor was very short, her contractions intense, and in one hour, Jay began to be born, and then everything stopped. Literally. The, the delivery room went dead silent. The doctor's face grew red. I could sense the urgency in the air, though I really didn't know what was happening. And then I did begin to realize what was happening because that little body that was partially delivered was turning blue. And I knew this was a... And then the doctor started to get urgent and handing out commands, and he began to tug on that little baby. I thought he was going to tear him apart. What had happened is because of those intense contractions, his head had lodged in the birth canal and he couldn't be born and he was suffocating literally at that moment. In a few moments, he was delivered. They revived him. He cried. They gave him oxygen. He turned pink. And our fear and all of our anxiety and her pain evaporated and we were joyful. Yes, a little bit later on, a couple of hours, I guess, around 8 in the morning, I went down to a small restaurant. I think it was called The Cottage back then on Main Street in Hackettstown. And I tried to tell everybody that I was a father like it was the very first baby that was ever born in the world. <laughs> ah, yes. I remember that day. How I remember that day. I remember its joy. It was irrepressible. It bubbled over in me. There was nothing I could do to stop this joy that... I was a dad. I was all of 21 years old, and I was a dad, and I was so excited about being a father. And it was even sweeter given the brush with real danger that we had experienced. And so we're going to talk about joy this morning. We're going to talk about going into that place with Elizabeth and Mary where we can learn about their joy. Obviously, we are doing this as part of Advent, which means coming or arrival we are taking a look back at the first coming of Jesus as we also take a look ahead to the second coming of the Lord, his advent. And I hope that it's not just been something that you've sort of hit and missed on. I hope that you've been making this journey intentionally. You received a devotional book from us. I hope that you've been tracking along with that. If you haven't, um, you should be getting an email. I think it's day 15 today, I believe. You could join us. You can get in on it, and you can begin to prepare your heart for the celebration of Christmas. But right now, we are in Advent, and we're rediscovering the joy that can be ours because of the Christmas story. How many of you need to rediscover a little joy? <laughs> I think uh, 2020 is going to go down in history as one of the most stressful and weird years that we've had in a century. Yes, aside from being in a world war, it's just, it's been absolutely terrible, and it's a long way from over. It's a long way from over, but we as Christians can know joy because one of the things that gives us joy is the realization as part of Christmas that we are celebrating one whose name is Emmanuel, which means God with us. God with us. There's a lot of joy in the Bible story around the birth of Jesus. But it's especially important for me this morning to note to you that the joy that's experienced in that story is not a joy that is separate from pain or disappointment. In fact, a lot of the joy that's experienced comes out of a great deal of pain and disappointment. Why do I mention that? Because if 2020 has been a tough year for you, if you're feeling isolated, if your marriage is stressed, if your business is in difficult time, if you've lost someone, and I hope that you haven't, and I'm not aware, but if you have lost someone, I pray that you will know that out of that pain, out of disappointment, out of grief, God can bring great joy. Amen? Luke's story includes an account of a priest named Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. In the first chapter of Luke, verses 1 through 5, it says, In the time of Herod the king of Judea, 
there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah, and his wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But, <laughs> don't you love when the Bible throws in that little conjunction? <laughs> you know something bad's coming. But, they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well along in years. The Holy Spirit inspires Luke to pack in a whole bunch of information there. He says, first of all, just be aware that all of Judea, all of the Jewish people were dealing with this puppet king named Herod, and he was not a good guy. He was anything but devout. And then it, he says, but I want you to meet a couple of people who were both, both of priestly lineage, people who were described as righteous and blameless and faithful. What we learn in the Gospels at the time, by the way, and you know this if you remember, many of the religious professionals of Jesus' time, the priests, the scribes, and the Pharisees, were not really all that great of people. They had, Jesus often reserved scathing remarks for them because they had an external sense of being moral and good, but inwardly, he called them many things. He said, your, your tombs full of dead men's bones. He said, you're hypocrites, scathing remarks. And in the middle of those religious professionals, if you will, there's this couple. And the Bible describes them as righteous and blameless. It's not a stretch of imagination for me. Maybe, maybe for you, but it's not a stretch of imagination to think that because they were righteous and blameless in a sea of people who were somewhat corrupt, they didn't really have a great social circle. That happens, right? If you're the person who's doing right, the person who's living well, the person who's, you know, observing the right things, you're not always made real comfortable among people who aren't doing those things. So they're going through this. It's a difficult time, but I don't think that's their biggest problem. In fact, the Bible goes on to say, no, that's not their biggest problem. It's not the fact that they're feeling isolated or they're feeling alone. The Bible says their real sadness is related to something else. They don't have any children. Childlessness in the Jewish culture, childlessness is still a sadness. And, and I, I've talked to many women over the years of ministry who really, really struggle with the sense that they're not able to have a child. So I, I empathize at some level. But childlessness was an even bigger deal in the Jewish culture than it may be to us because it wasn't simply a personal sense of loss. A woman who was unable to bear children was often thought to be under the judgment of God. It had to be her fault. She had to have done something that had caused God not to allow her to have children. And she was often questioned and, and treated with suspicion and given unfounded blame. And their self-worth was often devastated. You read it in the Old Testament. Go back all the way to uh, the early parts of the Old Testament, all the way through to the story of Elizabeth in the New Testament. And we learn that those who are childless are in a difficult position and they are sad. So Elizabeth is dealing with this, and the Bible caps off the, phrase, the paragraph I've just read by saying, and they were well along in years. In other words, the hope of having a child was done. It was, it was over. That chapter they thought had closed. But we learn as we go on in the story, and I'm going to read it to you this morning, that Zechariah, while he was doing his rotation of priestly duties in the temple, was met by an angel, Gabriel. Guess what the angel said to him when he showed up? Fear not. <laughs> you don't even have to be a Bible scholar. Fear not. And then he went on and he told him, Gabriel, uh, rather, Zechariah, I have a word for you. You're going to have a son, and he's not just going to be an ordinary guy. He is going to be a powerful, prophetic forerunner of the Messiah. And Zechariah, being the giant of faith that he was, said, <laughs> right. Have you seen my wife? She's well beyond bearing children. And you know what the angel did, right? He said, okay, Zechariah, you can just uh, not talk for the next nine months. Yeah. You want to say bad things about your wife? You want to doubt God? Well, then you just won't talk. Can you imagine being a priest with priestly duties and you can't talk? That's a problem. And he didn't. 
But Elizabeth more readily believed God's promise. And when she became pregnant, she says this, The Lord, in verse 25, The Lord has done this for me. In these days he has shown me his favor. And listen to these words, Taken away my disgrace among the people. So there's the backdrop. And then if we were watching this as a movie, we might find this. Meanwhile, in Galilee. I might just scroll across the screen. Meanwhile, in Galilee. So what's going on? When Elizabeth is about six months pregnant, Gabriel makes another earthly appearance. This time, he appears to Mary, and he delivers the, mo- he delivers the news about the most miraculous pregnancy. Mary, you are going to bear a son, and that son's father is God himself. Hmm. She received the news gracefully. She received the news willingly. But at some point, and you know the story. This is not new information to you. At some point, Mary had to know that this was not going to be an easy road. Once again, in that culture, to be unmarried and to be with child was an ultimate shame. It would render her as being unmarriageable, probably, in her culture, It would certainly mean that she would live in scorn and with some level of mockery and probably in poverty without anyone to support her, without being part of a family. And how could you make people believe that your baby was indeed the Son of God? I mean, try to imagine if you lived in Mary's age and she's 16, 17, she turns up pregnant and she says, God got me pregnant. You'd look at her like she probably needed help, right? I mean, that's, let's just be honest. Let's be honest. Even Joseph didn't believe the news at first. Matthew tells us that Joseph planned to go ahead and break their engagement. He said, I, I, this, this isn't for me until God intervened with him. Mary knew that her journey would not be easy. That's probably why we read this. Meanwhile, in Galilee, she makes the decision, we read in Luke chapter 1, verse 39, to hurry to a town in the hill country of Judea. You know who's there? Elizabeth. Elizabeth. And this is where the joy erupts in the story. She arrives at Elizabeth's home, and the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 1, verse 41, And when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And in a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed what the Lord has said to said to her will be accomplished. What a relief that must have been to Mary at that moment. She doesn't have to explain. She doesn't have to justify herself. She doesn't have to try to pretend, for God has spoken on her behalf. God has explained her pregnant state as a blessing. Elizabeth knew, and even Elizabeth's developing baby felt the touch of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says, he leaped with joy. You know the identity of her baby, I hope. Her baby was John the Baptist. Yes, the forerunner of Christ. Mary's joy comes bursting through this narrative in the first chapter, verses 46 to 55. We, we don't know whether at this very moment Mary penned these words or in reflection later on she wrote this song down and it was included in the Gospels. But in any event, she is reflecting on the feelings that she had in that moment when the Holy Spirit confirmed through Elizabeth the, feel, uh, the word that she had received from Gabriel. And she says, My soul glorifies the Lord My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Wouldn't you love that to be your song? My soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in the winning of the lottery. My soul rejoices in the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Mm. (laughs) 
She goes on to say, His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down the rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he sent the rich away empty. He's helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised to our ancestors. Oh, friends, what a song of joy. We need to discover that kind of joy in our lives. Two expectant mothers, both touched by the Spirit of God, sharing God's affirmation of their faith, and they both have a profound experience of the joy of the Lord. Hmm. There's so much to take away from that story. So much to take away from that story. Let me just observe a couple of things before I finish up this morning. The first thing that I want us to take away from that story is this. It's okay, Christian, to be joyful and happy. (laughs) You you may be scratching your head and saying, wow, Pastor Jerry must have really dug deep into Scripture to come up with that realization. But there is this, this underlying kind of feeling among many Christians that somehow, if you're not, suffering, if life's not hard, if you're not incredibly stressed by the situation of life, that somehow you're not quite as spiritual as you ought to be. That's a lie. God doesn't just love people who are miserable. (laughs) Now, It is true that God uses hardship to refine us, but he is a God of joy. He loves that people will experience joy. And you've heard me contrast in the past joy with happiness. It's it's somewhat of of a false dichotomy, and yet there is some truth to it. Happiness is largely circumstantial and therefore temporary, but joy is deeper and more fulfilling because joy comes from within a realization of our state of being as children of God. My soul rejoices in God, my Savior. Mm. The truth is, God loves both joy and happiness. You're not more spiritual if you go around with a long face. No, it's true. Now, it's fine to want to be happy, but let me add this caveat. The problem with happiness comes if you and I try to manufacture happiness. People do that all the time. They drink too much. They spend too much. They chase around. They do things they shouldn't be doing, trying to manufacture happiness. That's a problem. That often leads to sin. The other problem with chasing happiness is this. Sometimes Christians refuse the call of God because they let happiness outrank obedience. There was an old prophet in the New Testament who ended up in the belly of the fish who did that, and his name was Jonah. He says, I'm not going up to preach to those Ninevites. They're nasty people. They're threatening people. They're our enemies. I'm not going to go up and preach to them, because if I do, they might repent, and if they repent, God will be merciful, and I'd like them to go to hell. So I'm going to just run off on a ship, and what happened? He went off to chase his own happiness, and he ended up in more misery, and that's what happens to people who prioritize happiness over joy. My soul rejoices in God, my Savior, even in obedience, but it's okay. It's okay to want to be joyful and to experience happiness. Nothing wrong with that. Let me add this before I move on. If you, and it is easy to do in the Christmas season, those of you watching online, hear me carefully. If you are driven by obligation and busyness and guilt in this season, you need to tell yourself it's okay to sit down and relax. It's perfectly okay to say no to some of those requests that people make of you. It's perfectly okay if all your decorations would not win an award in Better Homes and Gardens. It's okay. You need to tell yourself that. Pastor Jerry, you need to tell yourself that if you don't preach the world's most scintillating and interesting and inspiring sermon, it's okay. Hmm. Second thing that we learn from these two ladies is this. Let me catch up here. 
Joy is our strength that sustains us in our times of trouble. Remember the story in the Old Testament of a man named Nehemiah? God woke Nehemiah up. I don't mean literally woke him out of sleep, but he awakened in Nehemiah an awareness that the temple was still in ruins, that the city of God, Jerusalem, was still destroyed and defenseless. And the Bible says that in Nehemiah's original response was to sit down and weep. He was brokenhearted as God began to weigh into his life about this need. So what did he do? He didn't sit around and mourn. He didn't try to manufacture happiness. Instead, he went to the king under God's leading. He asked Artaxerxes if he could go back to Jerusalem, and he even got the king to finance the rebuilding of the city. The process, though, was more than just a return to a city or the building of physical walls. He did never get to build the temple, by the way. That had to wait for Ezra. But it was more than all of that. The process also was a time of spiritual reawakening. The Bible tells us that after the city was secured, Nehemiah recognized this, and with Ezra, they called all the people together, and they began to read the law of God to them. Imagine that. They took Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and they just started reading it. They weren't preaching. They weren't singing. They weren't having a great service. They simply were, were reading the Word of God. And the Bible says that the people of God were so convicted, their hearts were so broken, there's so, such a realization of how far they had fallen from the plan of God that they began to weep almost uncontrollably. So Nehemiah stood up and he said, Serves you right. I hope you weep until you die. No, that's what humanity does. Nehemiah stood up and said this in Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 10. He said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared, for this is a day holy to the Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. He says, I want you to understand that you've been touched by God, but I also want you to understand that it is joy that will sustain you. It is the realization of who you are and your inheritance of the people of God that will ultimately sustain you. Shame and guilt only go so far. Christian, if you're still living in shame and guilt, if you're still trying to serve God out of some sense of brokenness or some sense of guilt or some sense that I just have to do better because I am so unworthy and I'm such a failure, you've only heard part of the gospel. The gospel touches us where we are, and the Bible says, My soul rejoices in God, my Savior. And it's that joy that sustains us. I can only keep up certain things for so long if I'm only doing them out of duty. But something I delight in doing, it's no problem. You know what I'm talking about, right? You ever had to do something just because it had to be done? How excited do you get about that? I woke up last week, and my house hadn't been cleaned for a couple weeks, and I said, man, i got to clean my house. I wasn't very excited about it, i got to tell you. My motivation was nowhere about getting out that vacuum and getting out the bucket, so I refocused my attention. I used a little psychology on myself. Yes, I talk to myself. I live alone, folks. Okay, it's all right. It's either myself or the dog. And I said, Jerry, you really like when your house is clean. You really like when the floors shine. You like when the cupboards are, are cleaned off. You, you like a clean house. You like your bathrooms clean. Who doesn't? So I said, you know what? You just need to know that it's 10 o'clock, and if you really get at this, you can largely be done here by noontime. So, Jerry, you can't eat, but you can't have another cup of coffee till your house is clean. So for the joy set before him, I got after it. I focused on the end result, which I do enjoy, and I got after it. That's a, that's a silly little illustration. But the Bible says that when we choose joy, it becomes our strength. When we understand who it is that God has called us to be, when we understand the end result of walking with him and serving him and loving him, there is a kind of joy that finds us. 
Peter says it this way, Though you have not seen him, you love him, even though you have not seen him now, you believe in him, and you are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Why? For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your soul. My soul rejoices in God my Savior. And that leads me to my final point. And I wrote about this on Friday. So some of you, if you read my coffee break, will recognize some of this thought. We need to make the choice for joy. We need to make the choice for joy. Regardless of our emotional state, regardless of our present situation, we need to make the choice to trust that Emmanuel is with us, that God is our Savior that we are capable of making it through this day and tomorrow and eternity because of the goodness of God until Jesus calls us to home. Amen? Now, I want to back up a moment again. I started here. I want to come back to it. Let's acknowledge our reality. I don't want you to be one of those Christians who lives in denial or who thinks somehow you paper over your sorrows and your disappointments by quoting another Bible verse. I, when Christians do that to me and say, you know, it's really not that bad, and they quote me a Bible verse, I kind of want to slap them. I don't like phony stuff. I love it if they say, you know, Pastor, I have a promise from the Word of God. That's good. But if they say, it's not really that bad. Listen to what the Bible says. It, you know, it just really, because that minimizes my feelings. We don't want to do that. Don't minimize your feelings. We need to deal with the reality. And sometimes reality is hard. Millions of people at this Christmas will be disappointed. We know that. COVID is keeping us home. None of my kids are coming for Christmas, and I'm not capable of going to them. And I'm going to tell you right up front, I'm kind of disappointed about that. In fact, I'm downright sad about that. Yeah. I'm not looking forward to the holiday like I usually would because I know that's gone, and I'm just acknowledging that. Doesn't, that doesn't make me weird. doesn't make me unique. Lots of people are there. Lots of people aren't going to get to go home and see mom or dad. or Lots of people aren't going to get to gather their family. It's part of the limitation we live with. Um, it's just the way it is. Some people are going to choose not to be in church on Christmas Eve. I look forward to that service. I love when we have 250, 300 people in this room and we all sing Silent Night together with our candles. And we'll be lucky this year if we gather 50 people, if that. And that disappoints me as a pastor, but I'm sure those who aren't willing or aren't able to come and gather are also disappointed. We need to acknowledge that, but we need also to understand that we can move beyond this. We can choose joy. My soul rejoices in God, my Savior. Hmm. Paul was inspired to teach this, and we need to understand his words are not a divine suggestion. They are written as an imperative. Rejoice sometimes. Rejoice in the Lord on alternate Thursdays of every other month. No. Rejoice always. Rejoice always. Rejoice always. Always pray without ceasing and everything give thanks. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus, 1 Thessalonians 5. That kind of choice allows the Spirit of God to flow into our lives when we rejoice, when we pray, when we give thanks. It's okay to start where we are. Psalm 13 opens this way. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? That's where the psalmist starts. You might be there this morning. You may be saying, Lord, how long? (laughs) Have you forgotten my name? What's going on? Where are you in this time? But that same psalm ends this way. But I trust your unfailing love, so my heart rejoices in your salvation. My soul rejoices in God, my Savior. This is the word for us today. We can embrace joy no matter what we're going through, no matter where we are. We can rediscover Christmas. The good news of the angels will bring great joy to all of us. Here's what they said. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of, good news of great joy. That is for all the people. I think, I think that includes you and me. I think that includes those of you who are watching. Today, 
in the city of, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, and he is Christ the Lord. He is Christ the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, as we think of Christmas in 2020, joy can be a little bit difficult to access. Lord, I know in just this little congregation, there are people who are struggling with all manner of difficulties, sickness, uncertainties, doubts, loneliness, frustrations, economic woes. Lord, would you, by your Holy Spirit, teach us to rejoice in God our Savior. Lord, like Mary of old, even when our circumstance is hard, may we choose obedience, lift our eyes higher, and know that you are an unfailing God in whom we can put our trust. Lord, I pray for anyone in this room, anyone who may be watching online in the webcast, and I ask that if they do not know you as their Savior, that they would open their heart today, they would simply invite you, Jesus, that they would respond to that stirring that they may not understand completely and say, Jesus, be my Savior. Take away my guilt and let me experience the joy of the Lord. And Lord, I'm confident you will. And now as we close this service, we ask Jesus that we will know your presence as we move into our time of communion. We ask this in your holy name. The Bible tells us to prepare our hearts. And so we're going to do that this morning. We're going to take a moment, invite the Holy Spirit to examine your heart, and then we will share communion. Father God, as we come to this table this morning, we come with the realization that we need your touch, your forgiveness. Lord, we ask that you would make the bread and the cup a meaningful expression to us, that the mystery of the broken body and the shed blood of Christ would come to rest on us, that we can rejoice in God our Savior. We thank you. Make these few moments holy moments, and we ask Jesus' name. The Bible tells us that Jesus first took the bread, and when he broke it, he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The bread speaks to us of his incarnation, the fact that he was holy God and holy man at the same time. What a wonderful mystery. It also assures us that he is a high priest who can be touched with our needs. And so as we prepare to eat the bread this morning, if you've come into this place and there, or you're watching online and there are broken parts in your life, broken places, you may wish to stand. By just standing, you're saying in a silent prayer, Lord, I need to be fed and strengthened and nourished because there are broken places and disappointment. I need you to help me to find joy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for feeding us. I pray that this bread will become for us not only nourishment to our bodies, but food for our souls as we remember that you are the bread of life. Bless this bread which we eat to honor you, Christ. In your name I pray. Shall we eat the bread? then if you're able to stand, all of us standing as we close the service, or as we close this time, it says that Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this when you drink it in remembrance of me. This is love, God's love, written at the expense of Christ's life, reconciling us to our Savior our God.
our Father, our Creator. And so, Lord, we take this cup. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your love. I pray that the covenant will be written in our hearts, Lord, that we will be people who know joy in obedience, that we will serve you, Lord, and honor you with all of our lives. As we drink this cup, Jesus, we do so recognizing you. We do so in faith and with thanksgiving. Amen. Shall we drink the cup? Hallelujah. Thank you for sharing the service today. So good to have you here. Rejoice always. Pray about everything. And everything... Give thanks, for this is the will of God for you. Amen? Now may the Lord bless you, and may the Lord keep you, and may his presence be with you. God willing, we'll see you here next Sunday. Walk with the King.